Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Twisted New Testament, or as we call it nowadays, Judaism and Christianity, a contrast with Rabbi Stewart, the man federal out of Big H, Houston, Texas. Welcome hello, back. Hello. Welcome back, everybody. Good to see you here. Um, glad you all made it in. The phone lines uh, in about 30 seconds will be wide open. You guys can call in with your pressing New Testament questions. Uh, why does it keep asking me to sign this in? I love this software. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. Okay, so I'm logging into it now. And the number will be on your screen in just a moment as soon as I log in here. Uh, I'll put that up for you now. So, Rabbi, how are you today? Well, I almost fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> that means you probably missed were tired. tonight's show. You were probably tired and needing, needing recovery. Oh, boy. So, you know, that's that's okay to be tired from time to time, you know? All right. Mm-hmm. All right. We are actually officially logged in. 855-952-4253 is the number to call in. Um, and so if you have any just questions. So uh, somebody uh, sent me a message earlier, um, uh, and actually an old friend of mine from from way back in the day, uh, and back in my Messianic days, uh, asked me what the uh, what, what Torah talked about the righteous non-Jew as far as keeping Shabbat. She was told that you cannot keep it at all, and I informed her that was totally not true. You can definitely keep Shabbat as much as you want to. Well, actually, let me rephrase that. Let me, let me repackage that. You can keep Shabbat as often as you want to. You just can't try to keep it the way God commanded the Jewish people to do it with their halakha. If you want to take off from work and rela- relax and spend time with your family, go to the movies, eat dinner, whatever the case may be, do your studies, that's, you're more than welcome to. But there's no commandment for you to do so. So anyway, that's just to get the conversation started going on. And uh, again, the phone lines are open. I do have the volume turned up where I can actually hear it ringing. So if you guys want to call in just to say hi, or if you have a question, uh, now would be a good time to do it. And uh, just for the uh, new viewers, of course, most of our views happen uh, in post. They don't happen while they're doing a live show. Um, for every uh, for every show, we may have between one and 300 people watching live, but the thousands of you in, come in later. So what I'm fixing to say will not fall to the wayside. If you haven't been there yet, uh, HebrewJumpStart.com, if you're trying to learn Hebrew, which I strongly recommend, at least you dabbling your, you know, sticking your toes in the water at least, uh, I think you should go to this website and you will find the most awesome production of a, um, according to the populace, the one of the best Hebrew teaching videos that are that's out there, and it's from Rabbi Stuart Federo. Now, I, I created the animation for it, but I only did I basically reproduced what he was doing with animation. So, uh, the the wonderful part of it comes with the brilliance of how he how he did this whole thing, and there's so many people learning from this. It's one of those videos that you would want to like watch over and over again because when the more you commit to memory, uh, the better off you will be in the future. So, uh, good to see everybody there. Um, I see Rabbi Federos in the audience again. Hey, Rabbi. <laughs> Mm. Oh my gosh! Okay, so uh, no one's called yet, but the phone line is there. I'm going to take that down and put up a more simpler post so I can put this up for Rabbi Federer's information there, so you can reach to him. Also, if you have any questions regarding that video, you want to you want to send it to uh, HebrewJumpstart at gmail.com or go to HebrewJumpstart.com and fill out the contact us uh, form there. Either one of those will work. And if you want one of the best resources for an- answering uh, missionary claims, one of the best fingertip at your fingers that you don't have to carry around in book form, go to his website, whatjewsbelieve.org. You see it right there on your screen. And, and the, these are the Spanish <coughs> and the Portuguese version. Right. Not available in English because we don't know what that means. Right. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's available in English. And so, uh, so yeah, go to whatjewsbelieve.org. You'll find that uh, that there's a lot of hyperlinks there uh, that are built in question form. Uh, actually, uh, Shannon, Shannon's watching. Welcome back, Shannon. Uh, Shannon. Hi, Shannon. Uh, and an app. Uh, no, there's not. There was one at one time, but uh, there just wasn't enough upkeep on it. And um, it turns out that the website itself, it kind of doesn't need an app because it kind of is an app on its own. You go there, you click a link, and it takes you right to your answer. It doesn't get more appy than that. So, um, there I'm you go. happy to be happy. <laughs> uh, yep, there you go. Okay, very good. Oh, look, Christo said that uh, a friend of his, uh, him and a friend of his, is actually trying to bring it back sometime. Um, I, again, I wouldn't rush. The website itself is brilliantly laid out. It's 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 so user friendly. <sighs> Whatjewsbelieve.org. That's what you got to find. Okay, so uh, still no phone calls. So I will uh, let me get that off the screen because it's taking up part of your chin room. Let's get rid of that. And there we go. Okay. 
Um, so we're coming into now uh, this. Of course, this is Rosh Hashanah coming up. Um, uh, I'm very mm-hmm. excited about that. Um, the holidays are, are coming upon us. We finally have a caller. Good timing. I don't know who it is, so we'll see who that is. All right, caller, welcome to the show. Please tell me your name. Where you're calling from? Hello, you're live on Hello. the Hello. Good evening, gentlemen. I hope you are well. I'm is Igor, this Igor? From Lisbon, Portugal. This is Igor. Welcome back, brother. Welcome Thank back. You. Thank tell you. Tell me how much. to tell everybody about my Portuguese book. Actually, how do Rabbi, I, let, how I, do I would get people love in Brazil? To here in Portugal. I would love to see you here in Portugal and bring William with you so you can <laughs> share the word of your book. That's awesome. And it would be a very special tonight talk in Lisbon, Portugal, and I would love to be present if that happens someday. That would be amazing. Uh, Judaísmo e Cristianismo, um contraste. Ooh. Very well, Rabbi. Wow. I can't wait to have it. I can't actually. That's, that, I like that. I like the way that sounded. That sounded really. That sounded really good. Mm. Very nice. Very nice. Well, that's Brazilian Portuguese. I was born in Brazil. I've been living here for several years, but that's the Brazilian Portuguese pronunciation. Nice. Well, very well uh, done. <laughs> gentlemen, my my question has to do, Rabbi, um, with the vision of Satan in Christianity. I'm relatively new to Judaism, and I've been studying a lot, uh, but it might be a question like Judaism for dummies, <laughs> but my question has to do uh, with Satan because it seems to be a very different kind of view uh, between Judaism and Christianity, uh, the vision of Satan. I would love to know what is the origin of this difference and what is the objective of Christianity in increasing Ooh. the importance Ooh. of these angels Ooh. the Ooh. point that is the antagonist of Hashem? Very good question uh, to bring out some really great points. Absolutely. I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a really brilliant question. And so, uh, yeah. Okay. Very good, my friend. Okay. So if you want to hang up now, you can tune in for the answer, and that will free open the phone lines. But, yeah, that's a great topic. Okay. Thank you, Igor. Thank appreciate you. Your... Hey, thank you very much for the work you've been doing. Really appreciate it. I appreciate it. that as well. Thank you so much. So, Rabbi, my first, my very first thought was, uh, uh, and I know this is not the, this is not encompassing the whole idea, but my very first thought was Dante's Inferno, Dante's peak, you know, the whole thing with the the threat of of hellfire and brimstone. Anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn this over to you. Take it away. You know, the interesting thing about Dante's Inferno is that he has a he has a, an area or a level or something, I can't remember which. Um, for the Greek and Roman gods. Wow, which fits right in, doesn't it? Well, yeah, it fits right in, but it also, you know, this is Dante, who's writing about hell, who makes it sound like he believes the existence of the Greco-Roman gods. Right. Just an right. interesting little inside, right. little you know, side thing. So I would definitely uh, say using that, uh, and and you could spin off of this or just go off on your own uh, to to go direct to the throat of Christianity. The the whole purpose of hell for them is a fear tactic to get you to follow their religion. That's that's well, in short. And, and and that's true for hell, but his question I believe Satan. was about the Christian creation of the idea of a devil. Devils they. They use two terms oh. for the same thing, devil and Satan. Right. Good point. Good point. Take it away. Okay. But but I think that there's something else going on. And just to tell you a quick story, um, back in my day, <laughs> now I am retired, but when I used to you know, be the rabbi of Shar Shalom in Clear Lake, Texas, uh, I used to have an introduction to Judaism class. You know, introductory to Judaism class, members of the congregation would take it, people from the community would take it, people interested in conversion to Judaism would take it. Uh, And one year I had a Christian pastor who took it. And, you know, I asked him why you're interested in it. And he said, because, and and he was totally right. He said, I want to hear about Judaism from Jews. I don't want to hear about Judaism from other Christians. We'll get it wrong. And he was right in saying that. 
So, you know, we do introductory preliminary stuff, whatever. And then the, the first, the next weekend, the next class where we really start getting into it, uh, I have a packet of sheets and we go through the quotations and it helps people understand what Jews believe and why we believe it. And one of the things we went through that second night, but first real night of, you know, going over stuff was exactly answering Igor's question about the difference between the Christian idea of the devil and the Jewish idea of the Satan. And when I read from Isaiah 45, 5 through 7, I create light and create darkness. I create good and create evil. It is I alone. Who, it is I who do all these things. The minister was so incensed and so upset that I would ascribe evil to God. Right. That he couldn't. He just. He was so upset by it. He literally walked out and didn't come back. So I bet he totally rejected the idea of the. Is it absolutely? Is it Isaiah also and, where it says and, I, and, I have when created? He got up, when he got up and he was so incensed about it, I said, "But this is what the text says. Pick up your Bible, throw away the sheets, look at Isaiah forty-five five through seven, read what it says." And he said, "Well, I don't have to do that because God is not. God has no evil in him and must." Not come anywhere near evil. So I, Isaiah fifty four sixteen is the is I, for me the scariest one I've seen. Yeah, and that's where it says, "Behold, I have created." Uh, what is it? I've, I've created the destroyer for the day of destruction. So it's like, wow, God created everything, including the one that's going to destroy everything. He created the destroyer to destroy. Right. Well, and, if it's existent, if, right. then God has to be the creator of it. Absolutely. But in Isaiah 45, okay, uh, let me find it real quick. Uh, What's the key phrase? I'll look it up by you while you talk. <clears throat> it's Isaiah 45, 5. I am the eternal. There is none else. There is no God besides me. I girded you, though you did not know me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the eternal. There is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and and create evil. Mm. Mm. I, the eternal, do all these things. And going to the Hebrew 45.7, Uvore Ra. Uh, and evil. create yep. evil. Yep. I, you know, I, I, and it's yep. Bore, it's the same word as yep. God. Exactly. Yeah. So you can't get around that. That's true. So I think what happens to answer Igor's question about why did they create this unbiblical view of the, of the devil, of, of Satan, in contrast with the biblical description of the Satan, I think it's because they wanted to separate God from evil. I think mm. it's because they, they had this concept of God is pure good, so where does evil come from? Well, we can't ascribe it to God, so we'll basically reinvent the biblical image of the Satan. Right. I think it, that, it, I, it also takes, uh, uh, it's funny, I never thought about that, but that, that makes perfect sense. It also, to align with what you just said, um, it also gives, it takes the burden of responsibility off of the person for their evil choices because they blame it on the devil now. Well, yes, and, that's and, also and, true. And they don't, you know, they don't understand that, uh, you know, that the the Eitzor Hara and the Eitzor Tov is actually that that is our Satan is our is our evil our own evil inclination, but we blame it on the person of Satan, so it takes the responsibility off of the person to make you feel right. Better. Don't blame me. Yeah. You know, the right. devil made me do it. It's not my fault. Right. Or if I may quote, uh, what's his name? The devil made me do it. <laughs> yeah. uh, can't think of his name, but that's funny. Yeah, I, but Igor is totally correct in contrasting the Christian idea of devil with the Jewish idea of the Satan. And not every time, okay, but most of the time, when it speaks of the 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 entity known as Satan, it's Hasatan, the Satan. Right. And we've discussed this a few times, but you know, if somebody says, "Hi, Rabbi." Then the word rabbi is like becomes right. like my name. They would never call you the steward. 
Right. They would call but you the if rabbi. They, if they say right. the rabbi. Right. That's a okay, specific. Now it's a description of a job. It's a job description. And, and of a specific. Of career. A specific, yeah. Yeah, right, or, right. or not career, but what's it called? A, Actually, uh, it would be because it's a title. I mean, Satan is a title. It's so, a title. Yeah. And that's the point. Right, is right. that it's a title of a of right. a uh, of a like you know, if I say hello, judge, right? But if I talk about the judge, right? Okay, so it's the same thing. Hey, like how oh, Ma, they knew exactly who the young woman was. R- exactly. <laughs> so if it's the, yep, Satan, yep, right. It's a so, specific entity. Yeah. Right. The the best way of understanding this is to take a look at Job in the very beginning. Oh, Flip Flip Wilson, somebody commented. Flip Wilson, thank you. Now, in in context, now, the, de- the devil we made talk me do about it. This, I can yeah. never remember the name Flip. That Wilson. was uh, who brought that up? Boycott Watch uh, right. and Wayman Kill Kelly Coley. Yep. Very nice. Awesome. Very good. Yep. All right. Let's see. Uh, I saw a question earlier. I can't remember where it's at. Let me see where to find it. Uh, Okay, guys, the phone lines are open. No one is calling in. This could be a very short show. <laughs> if you leave it up to us, Rabbi's probably still tired. Uh, let's see. I'm going to scroll back All up right, real quick. So, what do you got? Well, Job chapter 1, verse 6. Okay. Now, it fell upon a day that the sons of God, and that doesn't Ooh. mean God has kids, right. it means members of the community that believes in God, uh, angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and who else would be in heaven other than the angels? And Satan came also among them. So the Satan is an angel who believe you know, an angel. Yeah. And the eternal said to, to the Satan, where are you coming from? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Eternal said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth, a wholehearted and upright man, one that fears God and shuns evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions are increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, he will blaspheme you to your face. But notice that the Satan is talking. He says to God, put forth your hand, God's hand now, and touch all that he's had. Oh, all that he has. I see where you are now. Okay. Yeah. And the eternal said to Satan, and remember it's the Satan. Let me just go to the Hebrew real quick. Okay. And Rev Robin, sit tight. El Hasatan. So he's speaking to the Satan. Okay. And he says, "Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only upon himself, don't put your, don't put forth your hand." All right. So the Satan takes away everything. But the point I'm making is that the Satan is an angel walking around with the other angels in heaven. He never fell from heaven, you know, and he works for God, not against God, right. to find out what the truth is by doing these sting operations. Right. But he has to get permission from God. To do them, you could the way I describe to people uh, who uh, Hasatan is, who the Satan is, um, yep. and, and it may sound it may sound kind of like weird or childish, but it, it really you remember uh, the Fruit of the Loom underwear commercials where they had Inspector Ten Eleven, so Inspector Twelve, that was the final inspection to make sure that it was going to hold up to what it was supposed to do, and so okay. I w- I look at like Hasatan as like Inspector Twelve, the final inspection. If something's faulty about it, it's it's his job or her job to point it out to make sure that it's nothing's going to slip by. So I, I call Hasatan kind of kind of equivalent to Inspector Twelve. Okay, uh, Easton, sit tight. Uh, you're going to be the second caller. I've got one on hold, so don't go anywhere. Okay, sit tight. All right, well, okay, so real quick. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, by the way, I should point out that, you know, other faiths had the same duality of God in heaven above who fights against a God of the underworld or God in hell. Zeus, Hades, Jupiter, Pluto, Odin, Loki, Marduk, Tiamat, Ahura Mazda, Angra Mainyu in Zoroastrianism, and of course in Christianity you've got God against the devil. Mm-hmm. But, well, we'll get to it at any rate. Okay, so in the Bible, all the description of the Satan is that he was an angel who works for God, not against God, to find out what the truth is by doing sting operations, by getting permission from the judge, namely God. Right. Uh, yep. And just 
we don't have to go to it, but if you really want to look it up, okay, uh, take a look at Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 through 2. Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 through 2. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the eternal and the Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the eternal said to the Satan, the eternal rebukes you, O Satan, even the eternal that has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? What's this talking about? Joshua the high priest was sent into exile at the destruction of the first temple. And the text reads in Zechariah 3, 1 through 2, Joshua is standing before the angel of the eternal, that's the defense attorney, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him, that's the prosecuted attorney, the DA, district attorney. And then when it says, and the eternal said to Satan, the eternal rebukes you, O Satan, that is the judge, God, siding for the defense against the prosecuting attorney. Mm. And when it says uh, that, you know, God has chosen Jerusalem, which is where the high priest was exiled from. And when he says, is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? The Satan is saying he doesn't deserve to go back under Cyrus of Persia. He doesn't deserve to go back to be the high priest. He was, he's, you know, bad and he was exiled and that shows that he shouldn't be. But God sides with the defense against the prosecuting attorney, which is the Satan. And when he says, is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? What he's saying is that he's been purified because that's what happened when you take the brand out of a fire, the fire purified it. Right. Okay. So, um, let's see. Uh, set yourself a wicked man over him and let the Satan stand at his right hand when he shall be judged, let him be condemned and let his prayer become sin. So again, in Psalm 109, verse six through seven, Psalm 109, six through seven, again, the Satan is the prosecuting attorney in the court. Uh, let's see. Um, he also asked something else. And if I can find it real quick, I'm going to look. Uh, let's see. Hmm. All right. Rabbi, did you, did you square away with that question? Can we go and take a color? I, I was actually on a call. Uh, okay. All right, just quickly, uh, if you take a look at the Mesopotamian mythology in the Ross Shamra text, you have a description of Mesopotamian gods where a god named uh, Athtar, A-T-H-T-A-R, tried to take over from Baal, and he got kicked out of the throne of Baal and made the... Uh, uh, Head of the underworld. Does that sound familiar? Wow. Okay, I'm done. Wow. <laughs> okay. All right. Color your live on the air. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. Hey, this is Easton from South Carolina. How are you guys doing? Easton, welcome back, brother. Thank God. How are you? Oh, he didn't hear you. Sorry about that. I'll turn I'll turn Rabbi back up so you can hear him. Go ahead, Easton, with your question. So I've been doing a lot of study on, like, Jewish debate like with Nachmanides back in the day in the debate of Barcelona. I've been just watching a lot of Tovia Singer's older debates too. It seems like over time, especially recently, you know, with Tovia Singer being as knowledgeable as he is, that a lot of people that debate him try to discredit Judaism as well as right. whenever the Christian Bible is, you know, we don't know the authors, it's not authentic, verses were added. The argument changes from the defense of Christianity to trying to destroy the Torah and the prophets and everything like that. Is this, yep. this is kind of looks like a throw the baby out with the bathwater kind of argument, and it, it kind of defeats the whole purpose, because if Judaism is true, Christianity by default, you know, isn't true. And if, if Judaism is false, Christianity by default is false. So I don't right. see make the point of yeah. the argument, but right. maybe you guys can explain it better. It's like a suicide bomber. It's like if, they, if they can't win, they'll try to destroy everything in the process. Yep. Yeah, but, yeah and that's, that's been an argument I've seen in Tovia Singer's debates now, especially recently. Right. Well, one thing I've noticed about uh, any debater now is that the first thing that they try to do, they'll either disc they'll, they'll try to find 
uh, like trash on the person, and if they can't, they will just find trash on something else. They, they, the very first tactic is to dis, is to try to. It's kind of like if you ever watch a boxing match or like before the before a boxing match, they do a lot of trash talk beforehand to try to break the person down before they ever even meet to fight. Right. Um, this is kind of how debaters are. They they play dirty. They try to destroy the person or destroy um, the person's faith before they even discuss the Q and A. You know, and it's just it's just a dirty it's just a uh, way to fight dirty is really all it is, you know. And so, uh, yeah, if they can't if they can't destroy the person, they will attack the they will attack. And in fact, what's really wild is is that Christians I've noticed is will go as far as digging up things Christian Christian claims, mind you, Christian claims against the oral Torah, um, where they will try to find well, you I can't believe you support Judaism. Did you know Judaism supports slaughtering this and doing this and you know, promoting this and promoting that, you know, and they have no idea what they're even talking about. They have just found claims that Christianity makes against the Talmud to try to destroy Judaism before the debate even begins. And it's just, and, it's just and when they quote it, it and when they quote the Talmud, it's not that they were reading through the Talmud and they just happened to stumble across these passages. Right. They went straight okay, for that, that's Christian sources. Absolute lies. Yeah. What's going on is that they are subscribing to one of these messianic misquote of the month magazines. Yeah. And they're just parroting what they read. Yeah. And you can't really blame them because they're just quoting what somebody else said. You got to blame the, the, the source. Right. Where they they do the same thing with the Talmud that they do with the Bible. They mistranslate. They quote out of the context. They misrepresent. It's the same, same basic idea. Yeah. Interesting. Ethan, thank you for your call, brother. All right, thank you. You, thank bet. you guys. You bet. Have a good one. All right, let's see what we got here. Let me get uh where did he go? He hung up on me. Dude. He did. Okay, I got one more here. Okay, yeah, I think Igor is calling back. Let me let me see what he's got. Igor. Uh by the way, first of all, before you go, um uh Rev Robbins, call back. You hung up on me. Call back. Okay. Uh Igor, go right ahead, sir. Say it again, William? You're you're live. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Rabbi, listening to your answer uh, to my uh, question about Satan, you quoted the Mesopotamian God. And actually, I was uh, thinking about that the other day. I was wondering, because I have heard several times some of my Christian friends uh, talking about uh, the concept of reincarnation in a very, very, very negative way. Uh, associating uh, the concept of uh, reincarnation to something evil or mean-spirited or associating somehow to Satan, like a trap that Satan is trying to um, use against you to keep you away from Christ in some way. Uh, and I was wondering if, you, and please correct me if I'm wrong, if Judaism doesn't oppose to the idea of reincarnation up to the arrival of the Messiah, <coughs> and if most pagan religions don't oppose to the idea to reincarnation either, why does Christianity is so against to this concept when, in my opinion, it would actually be a good common ground so it could build up um, since you could take the Jews, you could take the pagans, and you could concentrate them in this idea of reincarnation and just add a Christological meaning to it and try to make a bigger success, so to speak. So my question is, why is the average Christian so against the concept of reincarnation? Okay, go ahead and hang on to your friends here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You bet, you bet. So that's really not so much a topic for, even though it's a Christian question, it's more of about why is the world so uh, taboo against the idea of reincarnation? Um, I don't know. I kind of think that there's a reason why Christianity may not like the idea of reincarnation. Yeah. Even though the concept is explicitly biblical. Right. But, you know... If a, and by the way, especially when you're looking at reincarnation from an Eastern religion's viewpoint, you know, if you have to keep, you know, 
perfect yourself, perfect yourself until you move out of the cycle of reincarnation, then what's the need for Jesus' sacrifice? Because you're going to get reincarnated anyway. You see what I'm saying? Right. Or maybe it's a case of uh, if I'm forgiven by if I'm forgiven for my sins according to Christian theology, uh, then a, then why would God need to reincarnate my soul? Right. Maybe, maybe that's another reason. So I think there might be something specific in Christianity that would preclude them wanting to believe in reincarnation. Yeah, right. Um, I think the reason why, I, here's the thing. So I think I think part of the reason why Christianity this, that this turns it off so much because it's just another thing that they can add to their um, implicable attitude towards, or shall we say, against Judaism in general. I think anything Judaism supports, they try to they try to bash. Uh, although they do they do things uh, and contextually, they do things that Judaism does. Like for example, they criticize you know uh, Jewish people wearing yarmulkes and all this other stuff. But but you have Christians who actually they they pray for their food before they eat. That's purely tradition. There is no commandment to pray before you eat. It's always to pray after you eat, right? So they have these traditions that they take on also, but they criticize Jewish people for having traditions, even though they do them themselves. Even the Messianic do the same thing. They, they criticize uh, Orthodox Jews, but they themselves will light sh- uh, Shabbat candles, even though there's no commandment in the Torah to do so. So it's, right. it's very hypocritical, you know. Uh, it's, it's a cherry-picking way to try to disassemble somebody. And when they find out they did mess up or that they, they are doing something, they will disconnect from you and try to not continue the conversation. So it's, uh, it's definitely it's just a, a sad way it happens. All right. And, and if Igor would like the verses, I would urge him to read Isaiah 26, 19. Isaiah 26, 19, your dead men shall live together with my dead body. Shall they arise? Awaken, seeing you that dwell in the dust, for your dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Daniel 12, 2, and many of those that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Not to confuse that with an eternity of hell, torture, you know. Now, to be fair, I don't see that as pointing to reincarnation. I call I, uh, it looks more like resurrection, maybe, but not re- reincarnation. Well, yeah, that's true. Okay, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to completely discount Daniel twelve two, Ezekiel thirty seven twelve to thirteen, Ezekiel thirty seven twelve to thirteen. Therefore, prophesy and say to them: Thus says the Eternal God: Behold, O my people, I will open your graves. And cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Again, res- that sounds very much like oh, and you shall know that I am the Eternal when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. Sounds like reincarnation to me. It sounds like resurrection. Oh, sorry, resurrection. resurrection. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Resurrection. Right, okay. Yeah, right, right. Uh, let's. I'm see. not against the idea of resurrection. I just don't. I just well, don't, I'm, I kind of think Isaiah in, 26, 19 I'm indifferent. clearly is resurrection. I'm indifferent towards the idea of, of reincarnation. Di- well, yeah, in terms really of you know. reality, yeah, uh, not really. What's the word? In terms of what I believe, right. I can take or leave it. Yeah, take s- leave same it, here. You know? Yep, same here. Color be right yeah. with you. Sit tight. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. It's, to me, it's not it's not a salvation issue, so why even bother about it, you know? Right. Uh, that, that's how I feel about it. Okay, color well, you. And because it's not a, res- a salvation issue or whatever, I think that's a part of the reason why they, the Christians reject it. That's a really good point. Yep. Color, you're live on the air. Please tell me your name. Where are you calling from? Hi, I'm, I'm Lisa Reed, and I'm from Indiana. Hi, Lisa. Welcome. Hello. Thanks. I'm not for sure if I have one question or if I have two. Um, That's fine. Ask them both. I'm just, I'm just curious of if there's any idea of what percentage of the New Testament that is actually oral Torah or percentage of the New Testament that is actually correct Tanakh teaching. I mean, if you see what I'm saying, I, do. I mean, I do. Yes. any idea of what percentage is actually trustworthy? Yeah, so as an ex-Messianic myself, um, of course I was Christian for years, and I, I, I turned Messianic um, because of the idea that there's a lot of oral Torah being passed down, uh, and um, I would say I would say there's nothing in there's nothing in the New Testament that professes outwardly to be 
uh, oral law, except you might find something like in Acts chapter 15 uh, regarding circumcision that it leaks in there, but they don't actually come out and say it. Um, I think what happens is uh, b- before uh, 70 years ago, before that, the New Testament was just New Testament. It wasn't really until the Messianists came around to try to to try to uh, make the New Testament seem more Jewish. That's when they started doing damage control because they started realizing there was problems with the New Testament. So they had to come up with answers. And the way they came up with answers is they do damage control to try to figure out why, uh, if, if this sounds like it contradicts Torah, we got to figure out a way to explain it so it doesn't sound like it's contradicting Torah, right? And so that's where it all began. And so uh, in general, um, you know, Rabbi Singer said it best, anything that's new— uh, how do you say it, uh, Federal? He, he say, what, what's it, new in the New Testament is not good. What is right. good in the New Testament is, is not, not new. new. That's exactly right. Right. Yep, but so. in terms of percentages, yeah, I, I don't know how to do a percentage, but I will tell you, there are books on the subject of the Jewish origins or rabbinic origins, or you know, I don't know how to how to Google search it or go go to YouTube to search it uh, uh, of the New Testament where it will take you through, uh, for example, uh, what Christians call the Lord's Prayer. Mm. Uh, uh, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the kingdom come, and will be done on earth as it is in heaven, whatever. Uh, and you'll find books that will take every phrase and give a rabbinic or Hebrew scriptures source for that phrase. Okay, it's still a Christian prayer. Okay, don't misunderstand me, but if I understand your question correctly, you could take a look at a book like that, and you will find the source material where some of that stuff came from in in Judaism. But mm-hmm. percentage, I, I don't know if I could, yeah, give you a percentage. I would say that out of everything I've read, there there is a lot of truth in the New Testament, but again, it's not new though. It's, it's, it's just confirming, e- even Paul's writings, he talks about, you know, uh, keeping the Feast of Passover, you know, and it's like, well, that's, that's a good, right. that's yeah, a good now, thing. Yeah, would you count that? Right. But, well, my point is, it's, it's teaching you, it's telling you, you know, good things. So it's not, it's not so much that it's wrong. It's just, is it 100% accurate is, I think, would be a more accurate question to be. Right, right. So, or untainted, and, and, untainted and, truth is kind of how I look at it. So. And, and if they have a verse, okay, that comes from the Hebrew Scriptures, supposedly, and they're quoting it, but when they quote it, they misquote it. Would you count that? Yeah, you I mean they're misquoting yeah, it. No, so no, you yeah. know, it's it's it no. depends on how you want to count. Right, right. Yeah. Do you do you have anything in particular, um, Lisa, that, that that is drawing you to the New, Test- New Testament, like saying, "Well, that was actually pretty cool." Is is there anything? Well, just wondering. Well, even like you mentioned the Lord's Prayer, because I had just wondered because I was trying to pick out what might be wrong in it. And I think the part that I thought was wrong was when they want to say, um, for, for, forgive us of our sins as we forgive others. And um, I don't know why that just really seems off to me. It's kind of like a conditional forgiveness. And so I was just wondering how to pick out I mean, I'm understanding they do tweak and twist things, and yeah, that is, right. it just seems like it's better to not read it because it's too hard to sift through the garbage. Part. Right. If you don't, if you don't know the original, how would you be able to sift through yeah, the, right. the New right. Testament and, and understand where it's changed and where it differs and where it contrasts? Yeah. And so the so really, the best thing you could do is to study Judaism. You know, God's created oh, yeah. religion, uh, and, and in order to learn what what it what what it should really be, it's like Toby Singer's analogy of a uh, uh, you know an FBI agent or whatever. They don't study fake money; they study real money. So when they come across fake right. money, they know it. Right. Yes, I would. Um... I would consider myself a Noahide now, and I'm not around anywhere where there's any Jewish people or synagogue closed. Hey, hey Lisa, but, um, Lisa, hang on one second. I'm, I'm, I want to catch this cover fest. Uh, caller, sit tight. We'll be right back with you, okay? Don't hang up. Okay, Lisa, go ahead. Sorry about that. Um, so I haven't read the New Testament in a long time, and I've only gotten into it since I've got the um, 
let's get biblical books again. Right. Wow. So, yeah. Well, um, so, again, you know, I think the thing that impressed me the most about the Messianic, this is while I was still Christian, I was thinking, man, they've got they've got a lot of so much stuff that makes a lot more sense towards Torah because they want to keep the Sabbath day, they want to celebrate the holidays and not do pagan holidays and all this other, other stuff. Um, and But it wasn't until after I and delved, uh, you know, really, really dove into it and spent, you know, three years under my biological father who was like a Messianic, a teacher, we'll call him a teacher, Messianic teacher for... Uh, for over 25 years, and learned a lot of stuff from them, and how the, how they said the new the Christianity is misinterpreted the New Testament, and they're onto a lot of really <clears throat> convincing things. But at the end of the day, it still doesn't it still doesn't it still doesn't work. It's, it's still worshiping the same New Testament, uh, their Messiah figure, regardless of whether his name is Jesus or whether his name is Yeshua. You know that it's it's still the same thing. It's just a different package with a different bow, but the same contents. You know. Yeah. I was involved with them for a little bit. Um, with who? And I couldn't be comfortable with the Messianics. Oh, okay, gotcha. Because right. Because I didn't pick up that it was really Christianity. There were some people there that were very hard-lined about kosher food, so mm-hmm. I wasn't allowed to bring any food to any of the services or anything because my food wouldn't be kosher. Right. And different things like that. So it felt, I still felt I was, you know, I was on the outside. I was never going to fit in. Right. And with my biological father, he was that way, too. I mean, from the outside looking in, they look very Jewish. I mean, you, I mean, yeah. thick beard. They always had the tallit, you know, and uh, they're wearing the, the zit seat and all this other stuff. And yeah. they had Torah scroll and, and their worship services and all this other stuff. And it, it looked very Jewish. Their food was always kosher. They celebrated every high holy day and all the regular holy days. And I was like, wow. But then when you go and start flipping over the stones, it's like, whoa, that's not supposed to be there. Whoa, that's not supposed to be there. You know, but it's all the stuff that they hide. So, yeah. Anyway, very good. Okay, Lisa, thank you for your well, call. I appreciate you calling in. Thank and you. You bet. You have a great day. Thanks. You too. Bye. You bet. Okay. Bye. Bye. Okay, now we go to Michael. Welcome. Come on in, Mike. What's up, brother? Hey, how you doing? Is this Eminem? <laughs> yes, it is. Awesome, dude. <laughs> good to see you, man. Um, thank you. Hey, uh, so I had a question. It was in. Hey, how you doing? Okay, um, how are you? Good. Uh, in this week's parasha, um, I'm 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 actually reading from the Gut Nick edition. Um, in okay. The commentary where it is. Go ahead. Mike, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I, I, yeah. n- now, I, I didn't see your message earlier, but now that you're saying that, I saw something come across my screen, and I think that was a question you're asking me. I want to let let's keep let's keep yep. new, new Testament questions on the table if you got one. If you don't mind, uh, it, it, it it's referenced. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. Uh, think of a good New Testament question. If you don't want to hang up, don't hang up. Just give me another question here in a second, okay? Rev Robbins, what's up, brother? Okay. Thank you. You bet. Oh my hey, gosh. I, hey guys. Hey, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Good deal. Good deal. Man, I don't know how I did that, but I answered one call on a different computer. At, uh, switch to this device. Oh wow, that is so weird. I've never done that before. Okay, hang on one second. If hey, if if I lose you, you have to call right back. I don't think I will though. Hang on. Let's see. No, no, yeah, I I, I lost you because I had to go to the store. Dude, okay. Oh, I got it now. Okay, I've got you. Wow, that's really weird. I've never talked yeah. between two computers and actually kept a phone call. That's good. All right, Mr. Robbins. Oh, yeah. What is up, my man? Hey guys, hope you guys are doing well. Um, I am uh just driving home right now. But anyway, um, I so Rabbi, I had a question um, about. I was going to say it was about the nature of God, but I think it's more along the lines of uh, of like what what is the actual the difference between the Christian concept and the uh, the Jewish concept of free will, if you will, because I, I I kind of always you know thought like. I mean, if God knows everything that's ever going to happen, um, h- how do we really have a choice in mm-hmm. in the way things go? I, 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 Good question. I mean, that, that's, that's y- you know, yep. very self-explanatory y- yeah, question. I, 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 it, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of, it, that's, okay. you know, anyway. You guys have a great night. Thank you, man. Okay, Appreciate brother. It. Sounds good, man. Okay, so uh, so that that's a that that's it, putting out a presumption, of course. Uh, that is, does God know everything that's ever going to happen? Does He know that, you know, five years from now, my next door neighbor might steal, 
you know, some money from his wife's wallet. That's 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 a huge assumption. We we think I think that we put. Um, I mean, I, I've seen there's so many places in Tanakh that, and Rabbi, you're going to correct me on this, I know, uh, mm-hmm. but I see so many places <clears throat> in Tanakh where um, there seems to be the element of surprise that happens, you know, and I think that that Christianity has done a really good job of painting um, everything into a place like we discussed with Satan earlier, um, to where it takes the responsibility off of the person. Um, and so by saying God knows everything that's going to happen, it kind of makes it easier for you to accept if you do something bad, you know, because it's like I was preordained to do the predestined to do this. Otherwise, God would God would have not known about it, which would debunk or, or dethrone him because he didn't know everything, you know, and I have I, I have a lot of issues with that. Um, you know, I, I my the way I would explain it to even my kids was is that God knows everything that's knowable. That, that to me that's an easy way to to wrap my head around it in other words for example if if uh, if I for example was standing on top of the Empire State Building and I saw the intersections coming the the long blocks that are meeting at the corner and I'm standing way up here and I see two cars driving down the road at the same speed at the same distance I can tell you right now unless one of those cars slow down there's going to be an accident I can see that they can't see it but I can because from my vantage point, I can see this sort of thing. Now, I don't want to get a lot of hate mail saying, uh, you know, William is debunking God and is dethroning his power and his, his omnipresence. That's not my point. But the thing about it is, I do believe that Christianity has really just, just packaged it so carefully um, f- to protect themselves uh, over a long period of time. So they take the responsibility off of their own choices and their own actions. You incorporate the devil, so it was the devil's fault. And God knew it was going to happen anyway, so I don't have to feel so bad. It takes the burden right off of the person, you know, which makes it a lot easier to accept someone else dying for your sins. So, Rabbi? See, I agree with you totally, William. I think that the aspects you're talking about really lend itself to taking the responsibility. It's not my fault. God ordained it to be this way. It's not my fault. The devil made me do it. It's the same thing. However, okay, I just, in my small little head or whatever, I don't understand, even if we're talking about God, why knowledge of something causes something. So, for example, I know within the next hour Within the next five hours, I know that people are going to get off of this uh, YouTube. They're going to stop listening. They're going to move right. on to something else. But just because I know that it's going to happen, I'm not causing them to get off. Right. Unless I said something stupid. Okay. <laughs> that would get them to, to you know, whatever. But <clears throat> right. just because God knows what's going to happen doesn't mean that, it, that God's knowledge, even if it's God, I don't understand people, well, if it's God's knowledge, then it's causative. Why? It's still only knowledge of the future. Knowledge of the future doesn't doesn't mainly causes the future. You know, I and I and I think that if you have room for free will, okay, the, William, there's a great story of a guy who totally believed in absolute free will absolute i mean like staunch believer in free will and he carried that to the point where if somebody sneezed he would say alligator <laughs> because his free will led him to respond to say alligator not god bless you or gesundheit or labriut or whatever okay right so of course you could argue if he's responding to a sneeze that that's the learned Whatever, but the point is, is that I just even if we said God is fully uh, uh, omniscient, knows everything, knows the future. I don't see why that's causative. Right, I don't right. see why that makes what God knows to happen to happen. Right, that's true. That's just me. Yeah. Right. Yep. Very true. Very true. Uh, somebody, uh, uh, actually, let me go back. It was, uh, I, I think I know the statement, and it was a good one. Um, in fact, it's something I never thought about before. It was Danielle Prince, and she said, uh, she said, so um, the Christians attribute the proper spelling to to the Creator's name, the Yud, the Hey, the Vav, and the Hey. Uh, mm. But then they call the Son Yeshua. So what is, <laughs> what, what is their name for the Holy Spirit? <laughs> it's got to be a different name. Anyway, I thought that was kind of cute. Bill. Bill. <laughs> 
But that was good. Now she probably didn't mean it to be funny, but I found it very interestingly humorous. Yeah, I so do. yeah. That was really good. All right, good deal. Uh let's see. All right, guys. If you have any more questions, be sure to call in. We've got our three. Uh this is awesome. So JSK, thank you for that donation. That was very kind. And also there's one more what I already commented. Oh, uh Calm Kitty. <laughs> I like that. It's good. Uh, hang on. Uh, let me let me see if I can, because uh, Michael Martell is who's the guy who just called in earlier. Um, he he always has really good insight, good questions. Brilliant guy. I mean, he's he's actually one of my moderators, and he asked me a question earlier. But uh, I'm going to read this off the page. I was going to ask how the Christian Bible references the New Torah. Uh, wait, the New Torah versus what it would actually look like, uh, since the word New Testament. Uh, self, uh, okay, hold on a second. Okay, Michael, call back in. Let's let's talk. Um, I can't call out otherwise. I already have your number. I would call you, but I don't. I can't do that. So go ahead and call me back in if you don't mind. And then, uh, yeah. So uh, we'll let him ask that question, and we can ask questions along the way. Uh, so again, I know you guys are tuning in late. Uh, you want to? You definitely. If you, if you have any desire whatsoever to learn Hebrew, go to HebrewJumpstart.com. Easiest website you can remember. You can go to. Um, YouTube in general, and just search in the tat, search in the search bar, Hebrew Jumpstart. It'll be the first video pops up. It's got probably three hundred and fifty thousand views on it already. Uh, one of the best Hebrew learning videos ever. But it'd be better for you guys if you could go to HebrewJumpstart.com because you'll find other resources there. Also, there's a, and I'm plugging you right now, Rabbi, uh, mm-hmm. because of your unfortunate uh, early retirement. <laughs> And it is unfortunate. No, it wasn't early. It was on time. But it's still unfortunate, though, because it didn't come with a retirement pension. So nope. that's kind of unfortunate. So there's a donate button there. If you guys got a couple bucks, you could throw it to him. You know, if he had, if he had, oh my gosh, if you had a dollar for every time somebody viewed that video, you'd be, you'd be set right now. You'd be set for life. I gave it away for free. Yeah. So what what that means is, and I'm plugging you on this right. I thought I was I thought I was on screen the whole time. I guess not. Uh, I'm plugging this right now. You need to come up now with a part two to that. Uh, putting letters together I, and like like the words and explain going to actually, the next level, you know what I mean? William, we have to talk because actually Marcy suggested this mm-hmm. is to come up with a workbook. There you go. That's a good idea. And that's not that hard to do. I thought about elements that should go into it. I just have to get off my comfy little chair, <laughs> my fake my fake lazy boy, and and do the work. Right. Right. Yep. Okay, well, yep. I want to interject something. Okay, sure, go ahead. Uh, if you take a look at 758 timestamp. Looking now. 758 timestamp from Tony Probst. Okay, looking now. Okay. There's a lot of 758s in here. Hang on a second. And he says. Shema Horus, is that right? Yes. Horus was known to heal also and walk on water and had 12 disciples. Same with other figures like Serapis Christos. Wow. Tony, I'm begging you. I, I know of all these statements that people will make of all the greco-roman egyptian whatever gods who had you know where jesus's story is pick one from this god and then pick one from this god and pick for you know but i i need i need the sources <clears throat> where exactly in egyptian writings does it say Horus was known to heal and walk on water and had 12 disciples. And somebody's got to put this together where it's not glittering generalities, okay, right. like I give. Hercules, his mother was human, his father was God. Sounds like Hercules, but also sounds like Jesus. I need a list where you have a, the, 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 the pagan idol God and what he did and the citation in their own literature that says that he did that because right. then it becomes unstoppable now when i tell this when i bring this up when christians talk to me I, they say oh well that was debunked that's their word debunked oh that was debunked uh sir james fraser the golden bow oh that was debunked okay but if i can show them here here's the egyptian papyrus where it says Horus was known to heal also and walk on water and have 12 disciples. Here, this is where it talks about Serapis, Christos. Yeah. Who, who, okay. Then, they, then what argument can they give? Right. I just think it would be a much stronger right. uh, uh, thing to say uh, if we had source material. That's all. Okay, hold on. Okay, let me... 
Okay, Michael, you're watching this either for me to talk to you here. So I didn't see the phone ring. Call again, 855-952-4253. The phone line is open. And I know your number because I see it on my screen right now. Uh, if, you, if it doesn't work out, he left a voicemail on my phone. So I'll actually play that audio clip if I have to. So let me make sure. Thank you, Tony. So, so somebody asked on here. Somebody, and, somebody needs to make a long, long list of all these similarities, right? And the source. I'm sorry. Go ahead, William. No, I was just going to say that uh, somebody actually had a, a question on here that, uh, and a, a, a YouTube handle worshiper of life. I believe they're a Christian or whatever. And uh, I've been following their their comments and question lines for for quite a few videos, and they seem to be kind of on point. So um, they asked a question, and the only reason I'm going to repeat it is because I've actually heard. Uh, some other people ask the same question, which is weird, and it's about Hitler. So was Hitler evil? Mm. You know, and it's like, of, of course, his acts were very evil. He's very wicked. He tried to commit genocide against the Jewish people. I'm curious as to why you would ask that question, though. So if you have any more context you would like to add to that, I would appreciate that very much. Okay, so I'm going to look for Michael Michael's phone number. I still don't see you calling in, Mike. Uh, let me let me play this. Let me listen to this and see if this is the actual question. Hang on a sec. Oh, that was actually not him. That was me. Let's call from another number. Same. Uh, okay. Uh, for whatever reason, you're not getting through um, because I, the phone line hasn't rang at all uh, since the last phone call we had. So um, if you want to, hey, Michael, if you want to um, leave a voice, do it via voice message on my phone. If, if that doesn't work there, and I'll play it on speakerphone if I have to. So, okay, cool. It'd be better to talk to you, though, because it's better to make connections so we can ask questions about clarification. Uh, William. So, yes, sir. Charles writes, can the rabbi please touch on the 2300 day prophecy? When did it begin? When was it concluded? I, I'm not sure what he's referring to. Do you know what a 2300 day prophecy is referring to? No, I've never heard about that. And it doesn't seem like it'd be pertaining, no, no, pertaining to the show anyway. Uh, so I see something I'm remembering about a 1800 something but I don't remember a 2,300-day prophecy. Charles, I'm sorry. I just don't know what you're referring to. Okay, so Justin has a, 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 an interesting question. He said, if Paul said, this is at 8.07 p.m., if Paul said we are set free from the law, where does the Christians, where do the Christians get their moral obligation requirements from? Good question. Yeah. Because. <laughs> yeah, right. If, if. Uh, uh, you've heard me say this before, but if you're driving along and the person in front of you perfectly obeys the laws of a stop sign because he obeyed the law perfectly, does that mean nobody ever has to stop at a stop sign again? When when laws are right. given, okay, when, when, a, when a government creates a law, assuming it's a fair and just law, I'm not talking about dictatorships, okay, usually it's done because the peop- they think that it's better for the people and they don't think they're going to, there's not a time limit you know, on the law, well, actually some congressional laws have uh, sunset law, sunset law, sunset rules or whatever they call it, okay? But by and those are usually taxes. But usually, you know, laws are set up and they're set up to be permanent. So I'm not, and, and, and if there's no law, which is God's revelation to the Jewish people about how God wants us to act, okay, you, you could argue that Christianity can get moral obligations and requirements from elsewhere besides the law, you know, the heart, uh, what uh, I think Roman Roman Catholics call natural law. You know, by and large, okay, people make mistakes, people sin all the time, people do bad things by accident, people do bad things on purpose. But by and large, the majority of us are just trying to make a living and enjoy the lives we have and enjoy the people with whom we we live our lives. They're they're not going out and committing murder. They're not going out and committing, you know. They're not thieves. They're not. You know what I'm saying? Right. They just want to live their lives. So, um, they could argue, I guess, that moral obligations and requirements could come from outside the law. Um, I'm not sure how many could do that. How many right. laws you could come up with? Okay, so I found out that apparently when I crossed over the computers, remember I said I would, I've never answered the phone from a different computer before? Yeah. Apparently it 
disabled the phone lines because oh, I just because no. Michael said he's not getting through. I just called it myself. We, we did have some calls though. We did, well, we answered those three. That was before we actually had that crossover phone line though. So I oh. might have to actually uninstall the app and reinstall it again. Apparently, whatever I did broke the internet. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Uh, I just tried to call several times on my phone and it's not going through either. And we yeah apparently me. Yeah, that was a bad idea. So I won't do that in the future. In fact, I may uninstall it from other computer altogether, so that way it won't be a problem anymore. Okay, well, well, here we are right now at one hour on the money. So I guess we can call this a wrap for now. Um, I, I would keep it on, but now that the phone lines aren't working, it's, it's kind of taken a lot of the fun out of it. So um, one, one more thing real quick. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, I lost it. Somebody said something about... Uh, Charles uh, 809 asks question Daniel 813 to 14 thank you I you got to give me more information about what your question is than that well it might be self explanatory let's go look and see it, I looked I not clear on his question you said Daniel 813 and 14 right then I heard a holy one speaking another holy one said that the certain one who spoke how long shall the vision concerning the continual burnt offering and the transgression that causes a Paul Appallment to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. And he said unto me, unto two, oh, this is where he, <laughs> <All right. laughs> thank you. There you go. Okay. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 evenings and mornings, then shall the sanctuary ah, be victorious. The prophecy you asked about earlier, the 2,300 day, whatever it was called. Right. That's what that's talking about. Okay, this is a vision of Daniel. Okay. And it's a vision. When it says 2,300 days as a vision, it could be referring to anything, okay? And to be honest with you, I would, I'd have to look at this a lot more carefully before I could come up with an answer, okay? Right. I, it, and and it, it, may, it may have absolutely nothing to do with uh, the sanctuary being victorious. And what does it mean for a sanctuary to be victorious? It's a vision, okay? Uh, 8.15 and following is uh, the interpretation of that vision. But again, I'm, I'm not clear. I'd have to look at it more carefully off, off, uh, offline. Right. Okay, cool. Not cool. I just, I don't know what it is. Well, it, that's okay. That's all right. It's, yeah. it, like I said, it doesn't really pertain to the, to the context of the show anyway. So. Yep. Okay, good. I'm trying to uninstall the software on my computer here so that I might free up the other one. I think I did it successfully because I don't see it anymore. Okay, now, while, well, while we're actually here and actually online, I'm going to now attempt calling the phone lines again to see yeah. if that Yeah, Libby, you're right. 2300-day prophecy was Daniel 8. Yep. Nope. Okay, it's still not working. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to uninstall the software and reinstall it. That bites, man. Sorry, guys. I thought I was doing a good thing. All right, well, good deal. Well, we'll call it a wrap then. And, uh, Rabbi, thank you for your time. And I look forward to seeing you all. Yeah, sure. Yeah, same time, same place next week. I share morning. So, peace, everybody, and uh, Shantava. So, thank you. Later, everybody. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanaktalk.com. T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K dot com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanak Talk. Shalom. Hey, fuck.